if you can, please open your Bible to Nehemiah. As you can see on the wall, that's where we're going. And good evening. Happy New Year to, to you if you're here in person or at home. I uh, was away for just a Sunday, but I'm very happy to be back with you and always am excited to be with my church family. Nehemiah is where we're going to be looking through. The principles in it are applicable to all people at all times because they're written by God, of course. But specifically, we will apply them to our church. And I want to encourage you, if you're watching at home right now, this would be a very good series to tag. A fr- I don't know how Facebook works. Do you tag people? I, I think. <laughs> but however it works, send it to other people in the church. Encourage them to watch it because we're going to talk with specificity about Emmanuel Baptist Church and rebuilding our foundation together. And Lord willing, that will tie with three Sundays in January as we exposit passages about our foundational building blocks, our DNA at EBC. So tonight, if you're in Nehemiah, that's the text we're going to. Because we're introducing the book, we'll spend a little bit of time on the front end talking about what the book is. Don't get bored and think, when are we going to get in the text? We are going to get into the text. (laughs) But some introductions of kind of how the book is and how it works. All right, here's an opening sentence that I want to give. It relates to all of us. It relates to life. It does relate to churches, though, as well. Here's my opening sentence. Duress reveals more than it destroys. All right, duress reveals more than it destroys. Here's what I mean by that. Take duress. Take, for example, the coronavirus. Does it destroy some things? Yes, of course. Does it destroy some routines, some patterns? Because it, Can it inhibit things that a church can do? Yes, but it reveals more than it destroys. Here's what I mean by that. David Pollison is a noted biblical counselor. He's now with the Lord. But he used to use this illustration on stage and it, it was convicting to me. and it, it helped me a lot. On stage, he would take a water bottle and he would shake it and shake it and shake it and shake it and shake it. And then he would ask the crowd, why did water come out of the bottle? And the crowd would always say, because you're shaking it. And he would say, no, no, because there was water in it. And his point is that the duress didn't cause water to be in the bottle. The duress revealed what was already in the bottle. What Paulison is saying is something that Jesus taught. In, uh, in Luke 6.46, Jesus said, Out of the abundance of his heart, the mouth speaketh, or his mouth speaks. So the first thing we want to note, if we talk about our churches in America, or if we talk about Emmanuel Baptist Church, or our lives or our homes, is that duress reveals more than it destroys. See, the only thing that can come out of us is what's already in us. So the only thing that can come out of us is what's already in us. We can never say, I didn't want to punch my sister. (laughs) It was the circumstances. No, we can only say, no, this actually is something that was within me, that I was shaken enough that it came out of me. And surely this is true for all of our churches. Now, God, of course, is doing way more than any of us can fully comprehend. But one opportunity that God's providence over the coronavirus affords us is to consider, well, what really is in us? What is in our churches? What is in our lives? As we're being shaken, what is now coming out? And those things are being revealed. Uh, They're being exposed. What an opportunity then to learn and grow. Second thing, and notice the picture I have here of the top. You see that building that's collapsing. And the other buildings around it are, are standing. And this is a second principle Jesus teaches us. The building's foundation, not the storm, determines if it stands. The building's foundation, not the storm, determines if it stands. Think of Matthew 7, which we'll, Lord willing, get to in a few months. Jesus said, the wise man built his house upon the rock. Now, do you guys remember what happened to the man who built his house upon the sand? What happened to that house? You can say it out loud. It collapsed. Great was the fall of it, right? Now, both of them had a storm. So neither of them could say the storm is the reason that things have gone badly. But things have gone badly because you had the wrong foundation, right? Now, this is absolutely true of our churches in our country and across the world right now. Some churches, just to put the matter very frankly, are actually doing very well. Other churches are doing very poorly. Neither of them could say, well, it's it's the storm that has caused me to be doing the way I'm doing. It's the pandemic that has caused me to be doing the way I'm doing. No, that's not true. The pandemic is revealing. It's revealing the foundation we have. Duress reveals more than it destroys. 
Now, I have to thank God uh, for my sister Shelby Matthews, who's here, who shared this scripture with me today, which really helped put in a short uh, passage what, what we're going to look at tonight. It's from 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. Be encouraged by this first phrase. But God's firm foundation stands. No matter what the pandemic is or the storm is, God's firm foundation stands. Bearing this seal, the Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So notice God's firm foundation stands, and yet immediately the Lord tells us to flee at sin, to flee wickedness, to flee iniquity, because someone who flees iniquity, notice, is useful to the master of the house. You see that final phrase. So it's possible to have a good foundation that will sustain, regardless of what else is going on. The scriptures make this abundantly clear. Now, Nehemiah, I think, is a very, very helpful passage. I laughed to myself this week, though, because normally at church, if someone opens Nehemiah, there's a building program. <laughs> we're going to start a fund, and everybody's going to donate money. <laughs> That's not what we're doing tonight at all, nor is it actually why Nehemiah was penned. Nehemiah is actually not a book really about building walls, although it was very interesting to hear a few pastors from big states say that when President Trump was talking about Mexico. <laughs> but that's not actually why Nehemiah was written. Nehemiah is written about building a spiritual foundation. This is the reason Nehemiah comes, and this is the purpose of his ministry. So Nehemiah is a very, very helpful book for building a solid foundation in our personal lives, in our homes, but I will apply it very specifically to Emmanuel Baptist Church, how God can help us rebuild a foundation that can withstand global pandemics, because that's actually his intention for the church, that the gates of hell, in fact, cannot prevail against Christ's church. All right, so let's introduce Nehemiah. Now is the technical part of the talk. I don't want to bore you with details, but I want to make sure you understand God's word correctly. My job is to rightly divide it, so I want to make sure you understand the context of what we're going to look at. Uh, when and where is Nehemiah? So let me give you like a big sweep of the Old Testament especially if you're newer to the Bible. So there was a long time where Israel had no king. They begged for a king. Don't ever forget the reason. They wanted to be like the nations. <laughs> but God had a purpose greater than their sinful desire, and his purpose was to send a king of kings. And so he granted their prayer. The first king he gave them was Saul because they wanted a king like the nations, right? And Saul was exactly like the nations. He was sinful, he was selfish, and they got what they wanted. But then God raised up a humble king in David. David's son, Solomon, was also a good king, both sinners, but both good kings overall, and the kingdom prospered. But then Solomon's son, Rehoboam, was selfish, foolish, immature, didn't take counsel from others, and the kingdom split. When the kingdom split, ten tribes went north, and then two tribes went south, Judah and Benjamin, and they were just known as Judah. That's my son's first and middle name. Now, the, the northern tribes, because they wouldn't repent and they continued in sin and idolatry, the prophet said, if you continue in sin, it's going to go badly for you. They never repented. And so in 722 or 21 BC, Assyria took those 10 northern tribes, they scattered them, and they never came back. So they were lost to the winds. But the two southern tribes, known as Judah, were taken in 586 BC. They were taken by King Nebuchadnezzar. You might recall him. So let's bring us up on the screen here with what I've been summarizing to us. All right, so Assyria is the first world power. There are these very cruel people. They're killing, it, killing everybody in, in brutal ways. Then Babylon's like the next world power. They take over them. But you know how these things work. Nations rise and fall and somebody else takes their place. And so the third nation that takes their place is King Cyrus of Persia. Now here's what's interesting. I am from Italy. Uh, my, my dad's side of the family is. And I remember growing up thinking, man, I'm so proud to be an Italian and I love Roman history. And I would read all about Roman empires. And the more I read, I'm like, I don't know if I want people to know I'm Italian. <laughs> They're really rough, horrible people. Claudius, Vespasian, Nero, I mean, just really rough, awful people. But something Rome did that was kind of smart, one of the few things they did was kind of smart, is if they would overtake you, 
they would essentially let you keep your way of life. You're going to pay taxes to them, but they don't want to change too much of your culture. But that's not how it worked before. So if Assyria overtakes you, you can't worship your God anymore. You can't live your life anymore. And we're going to take your best people and they're going to live with us. Babylon, same thing. But Proverbs tells us that God holds the kings like streams of hands in his water and turns them whithersoever he will. And so when Cyrus became king of Persia, God turned Cyrus's heart. So his attitude was, actually, we want the Jews to worship their God and they're free to go back. And so he sent the Jews back in three waves or three phases. I hate the word phase because of all the political things. So we'll, I'll call it a wave. All right. So their first wave back is Zerubbabel. And that's recorded in Ezra chapter 1 through 6. Now, this is an important note. If you were Jewish and you grew up with the Hebrew Bible, Ezra and Nehemiah are actually one book. They're so compatible that they really normally should be read together. But we'll pick up in Nehemiah tonight. So the first wave is Zerubbabel. The second wave is 70 years later. And that picks up in Ezra 7. And that's the guys that you know from these books, Ezra and Nehemiah. They come in that second wave. And the third wave is continued then by Nehemiah, and that's what his book is all about. So this is all going on uh, in, you know, the 400s B.C. Ezra and Nehemiah's lives overlap, and it's a fast-paced book, which is why a lot of people like Nehemiah. It's a book of the Bible they like reading. It's a very interesting, true story, and it moves quickly, and so most people really enjoy it. So Nehemiah gets in Jerusalem, 445 B.C., 13 years after Ezra has arrived. Uh, and that's kind of where we're going to pick up. So who is Nehemiah? Well, we're going to figure that out throughout the book, but let me at least give away a couple of things up front. Nehemiah, notice in bold, was a gifted administrator. But God gives us all differently. It takes all types. It takes all the gifts of the Spirit to do what God wants to do, and Nehemiah was especially gifted at administration. He was wise enough to know what he wasn't gifted at. So when it's time for someone to preach or speak, Nehemiah doesn't do it. He calls Ezra in to do it because he knows that's what Ezra is very good at doing. There are some um, things we can glean from this, though. One would be, in what way would we have a similar role today? And the answer would be in the office of pastor. The Bible uses three words to describe the office of pastor. The word pastor is the word shepherd. It uses the word elder. It's where we get our word Presbyterian, presbyteros. And it uses the word overseer. Notice then, unlike Nehemiah, a pastor actually is tasked to do both. So a pastor, a pastor is tasked by God to teach, 1 Timothy 5, 17, the elders who rule well are worthy of double honor, especially those who labor hard at teaching and, and doctrine. But they're also responsible to lead. In fact, in the list of qualifications for pastor, the Bible says if a person cannot rule his own house well, how could he rule or lead the house of God? So Nehemiah had the one responsibility. Pastors today have two. But churches should have multiple pastors who complement one another in their gifting of this, which the Bible says over and over again. Praise God for the ability for us to have that here. So note well, though, that the book of Nehemiah, and this is very key, is not primarily about leadership per se. So normally, if you want to buy Fortune 500 books that are self-help books, how to start your own business books, how to run a company book, and they're quasi-Christian, normally Nehemiah is their template. <laughs> okay? But that's not really the purpose of Nehemiah. Yes, there's much to learn about leadership from Nehemiah. I'm not debating that at all. But that's not the purpose of the book in the flow of redemptive history. In that flow, the purpose of the book is to show Nehemiah not rebuilding walls, but Nehemiah rebuilding God's people so that God's Messiah can come. So D.A. Carson puts his finger right on it. I'll quote him. The book of Nehemiah is about God's restoration of his people in preparation for the fulfillment of his covenant through his son Jesus. Now let me tell you about a free resource. Anyone watching at home or here who wants to go really deep into the book of Nehemiah, the Gospel Coalition has a free course on the book of Nehemiah that Carson co-teaches, and you can watch some videos and read some books if you want to go further throughout the weeks, and I'll teach my own material here. But he was very helpful to me on that point. All right, so now I'm going to, I've been working down the funnel. Let me get very specific. Why does the book of Nehemiah matter for us? And I believe there are four reasons that are effective to our church in particular. First, Nehemiah is not a book primarily about rebuilding the city, but about rebuilding God's people with the right foundation, which we must do here at Emmanuel Baptist Church. 
and I believe churches across our country must do, as coronavirus has been a tool to reveal a lot of cracks in our foundations that must be rebuilt. And this is what this book is about, so may God help us to use it to rebuild well. Secondly, Nehemiah is a book about God fulfilling his promises as we obey him in faith, and this is important for us as a church right now. Even though the rebuilding process is very hard and fraught with much opposition and heartache, and many American churches feel this right now, they come in and they see almost no one in the sanctuary, they see almost no hope of how they can reach out to their community, there's all this fractured infighting about how we should approach these sorts of things. There's opposition without. There is turmoil within. What do we do? Well, Nehemiah has written about all of that and, and how to work through those kind of things together in faith, trusting God's good promises. This is why, third, Nehemiah contains a lot of practical wisdom about the ins and outs of spiritual revitalization because it's not a book about rebuilding the structure. It's a book about revitalizing spiritually. All right, and fourth and finally, Nehemiah ultimately points us to Jesus Christ, who is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that he would have a special descendant, his promise to fulfill the law of Moses, which no one has ever kept except for Jesus, his final fulfillment of the Davidic king, who, of course, no one perfectly fulfilled, and in fact, even the temple itself. And so the book of Nehemiah will help you and I, and it'll help Emmanuel Baptist Church collectively, to realize that we still need the same Jesus Christ <laughs> that they needed then. So now that you have some background, we can begin by reading in Nehemiah chapter 1. So hopefully you have it in front of you in your Bible. And uh, the first big point that I want to make, I think you see on the screen there, I'm calling lesson one, realizing you need to rebuild. I'm sure I'm making up this percentage on the spot, which is how most fractions and percentages are used, I think. But have you ever heard that quote? It goes something like this. It's something like 99% of fixing, of solving a problem is rightly identifying what the problem is, something like that. Like in order to find the solution, you have to correctly identify what the problem is. And I think what churches, including our church, has to do, and what I think Nehemiah had to help the people of God do is realize you need to rebuild like things have fallen apart and until we acknowledge that we can't rebuild so let's look here in Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 1 the words of Nehemiah the son of Hakaliah now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year as I was in Susa the citadel that Hanani one of my brothers came with certain men from Judah and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped and had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. I'm going to try to make you think here a little bit. What's the first thing that Nehemiah did to help him come to realize they needed to rebuild? He asked, exactly. Yeah, very, very, very good. So notice verse 2, he asked concerning them. Now, I, I do think it's worth pausing on such an obvious point. You can't rebuild a church until you're concerned about the church, right? It's impossible to do. So until people of the congregation start thinking, man, we need to be concerned about our church. We need to be concerned about our future. We need to be concerned about our spirituality. How are we really doing? Until you start there, there is no hope. And so here's my first point. Concern about God's people led to an awareness of the poor condition of God's people. But that concern begins with, how are we doing? What is going on? Are we a healthy church? Are we going to sustain on the other side of this virus, Lord willing? Are we able to fulfill the mission God's given to us? How are we actually doing? And Nehemiah is asking that as he should. Now let's continue uh, pick up with what Pastor Mark observed. He asked concerning the Jews who escaped, who survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. Now notice verse 3. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. So not only do we have to have concern, we have to be willing to hear the truth, even if it's hard to hear. And it's often hard to hear, and this is true in our own lives, and it's true about our churches. 
because we remember the glory days. <laughs> and so we can't believe that things are as bad as they actually are. But sometimes they are. So notice the end of verse 3. It's in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Now for time's sake, I'm going to have to cut some of the notes I have. But here's the bottom line of them, which I, you could read my notes further if you want to. This is not the first time the walls have broken down. This is something that's happened before, and now it's recurred again recently. Now, in our own lives and in our churches, this same phenomena happens where things are going well, and then they go poorly, and then they go well, and then when they go poorly again, we're too weary to fight that battle again. We're too discouraged. We'll start saying things like this, but pastor, we've tried witnessing to the neighbors before, and nobody cares. We've tried reaching out to the community, and we've had no fruit or in our own lives, we'll think, yeah, but I've battled that in the past without success. So it's very important that you understand that Nehemiah is hearing a report about a recurring problem. This is something that's happened in the past. It's happening now again. So what should he do? He still cares, and he is concerned about the condition of God's people. Now, what does that lead him to do? And verse 4 is, is absolutely wonderful. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Uh, I, this is probably an obvious question, but what was Nehemiah's response to the condition of God's people? To pray. To pray. To pray. Now, here's why I think this is very important. We typically think of Nehemiah as a man of action. Like, he's always moving. He's doing stuff with his hands. I mean, it's Nehemiah, you know. He's, he's not going to get up there and read books. He's going to roll up his sleeves, and he's going to work on buildings, and he's going to cut people down. But what actually does Nehemiah do first? How does Nehemiah first roll up his sleeves and work? He prays. Do you know we actually know exactly how long he prayed? Do you know how we know? Um, verse 2, or sorry, verse 1 of chapter 1 tells us the month of Chislev. Look to chapter 2, verse 1 tells us the month of Nisan. So it tells us how long he mourned and fasted and prayed continually. It, I'll tell you what the answer is. It was four months. So for four straight months, this man of action just prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, which again is a great lesson for us because sometimes we're like, well, I just got to jump to the thing. But no, actually our first thought should be, I need to pray and I need to weep over the situation we're in. This is not a situation we should be in, but we're in it. Let's weep over it and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. And he doesn't see that as laziness or a failure to work. This is the work. Right? The work is we pray. Uh, there's a million applications there for us, but just first see that in the text. And it's morning prayer. It's sad prayer. So number two, I think I have here, sorrow over the sad state of God's people. And then number three, continued fasting and prayer to God for God's people. Notice they're both from verse 4. So wept and mourned, sorrow over, we should not be in this condition that we're in. And then fasting and prayer, God help us get out of this condition that we're in. Now don't miss the heading at the top. You can't rebuild until you realize you need to rebuild, <laughs> right? So you can't rebuild until you're like, this is not okay. This is not how it should be. Things are not as healthy as they ought to be. God help us, help us. We are sad over how things are. That's a good way to feel. That's a holy discontent. And now we're going to look at the content of his prayer. And uh, there's much to draw out of it. So I actually have a full slide. We'll look at it a verse or so at a time. So Nehemiah's prayer. Let's look in verse 5. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. All right, so notice verse 5. What does he ground his prayer in? This is the foundation of his prayer. God. Yes, exactly. Who God is, God's wonderful character, God's covenant to his people. We all should ground our prayers in this. Our Lord Jesus tells us to. We begin with, hallowed be your name. So the foundation is, what a wonderful God we get to approach that has made us his through his covenant faithfulness. So that's how we begin when we pray. We always begin that way when we pray. So he bases his prayer on God's character and relationship to his covenant people. Now verse 6, let your ear be attentive. We might say in our own words, Lord, please hear what I'm asking. And let your eyes open 
to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants. And now notice the language carefully. Confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. What do you find interesting about that? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes. When he prayed chapter 9, right. when he prayed, he prayed for himself and his people. Exactly right. And if you go through the Old Testament, you'll find all the good leaders did exactly what Gordon and Shelby said. They include themselves in the sin of the people. They never pray. Lord, those hard-necked people over there, right? <laughs> Remember that one time Moses did that? He got in a lot of trouble, right? So instead, they recognize, Lord, we have sinned. Now, what's interesting is Nehemiah is not even there. And yet he understands that there's a connection between God's people in such a way that he's complicit. That here's what that looks like on a church level. It is very important that I am able to say, you know, under my pastoring, we have not done what God desires us to do. That, that, that is so important that we're able to say we are not what we should be. And that begins with me. That begins with me walking humbly before God and leading us in the way I ought to. So it starts with confessing our sin. So Nehemiah includes himself, not saying he's not complicit or, oh, it was them. No, no, this is, this is me too. By the way, these principles are very important for our home. They're important for the way we talk about things with our family. Uh, hopefully as fathers, we're not saying, well, it's, it's, it's your mom's fault, <laughs> you know, or uh, that sort of thing. We, we begin with, no, I, I'm sure that I'm wrong. Let me think about how I've been wrong in this regard. Verse 7, now he's going to detail it, so it's not like a just shallow claim. He's going to specifically enumerate his sin. Verse 7, we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. We disobeyed the Bible. We disobeyed what God said. That's how we know we're wrong. Verse 8, now he's quoting God's promises back to him. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, I love this, while he's praying, he's quoting the Bible to God who wrote it. Remember, Lord, when you said, if you're unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the peoples, which is exactly what God has done. But you also promised, verse 9, but if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. Now, we talked about this for six months, but I want you to see that Nehemiah is doing it as well, which is why we spent six months on it. He's praying Scripture. All right, so God, I'm praying that you will do what you've said you will do. This is what prayer is, actually. We pray God's Word back to him in the confidence that he hears it and will work it. So he confesses his sin, number two. Number three, he bases his confession on God's covenant stipulations. And now notice further verse 10. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. So he recognizes we belong to you and it is only by grace that we are what we are. And now I love verse 11. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. And give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now, I was cupbearer to the king. So the cupbearer to the king is what he's about to pray for. Lord, give me mercy and favor in the eyes of King Cyrus so that he will allow me to go back and help God's people. But what is the ultimate motivation for Nehemiah's prayer? You see it in verse 11. I pray that you will do this for your name. So, Lord, for the sake of your glory, your reputation, how people think of God, I pray that you will do this. So that's number five on the screen here. Nehemiah requests for God to give him success in the presence of the king for God's name's sake. So it ultimately is a God-word and God-centered prayer. Now, uh, we're going to notice, Lord willing, next time in chapter two, that Nehemiah does what he's more commonly known for. He throws uh, a quick prayer. Uh, he shoots a staccato prayer, if you will, as he's on his way to the king. But don't forget, that quick prayer on the day of the meeting was preceded by four months of fasting and prayer. 
Do you remember uh, in the last series I was working through, I taught you guys kneeling and walking prayer, how they inter interact with one another. That if you have a, a regular formal time, you come before the Lord and let your requests be made known to Him, that will feed those times where you're on the drive on the way to do something or on the way to walk up to your boss or on the way to a difficult conversation. They feed off one another, kneeling prayer and walking prayer. And Nehemiah shows us that. He has four months of sustained serious prayer before he comes to this one. A lot of people have noticed that as well. So I wanted to quote, and I think I have Derek Kidner in here who wrote it really well. Okay, here we go. Derek Kidner writes in his very good commentary on Nehemiah, Since Nehemiah's natural bent was for swift, decisive action, his behavior here is remarkable. It shows where his priorities lay. It also reveals, by every phrase in this verse, the unhurried and far from superficial background to the famous arrow prayer of chapter 2, verse 4, and to the achievements which were to follow it. Kidner's point is the future success that God will, will bring to light was fueled by this early four months of fasting and prayer that first plowed the foundation for it. And so it will be for our church, honestly. And so it will be for our homes. If we expect God to revitalize Emmanuel Baptist Church, then let us pray. <laughs> and let us pray and fast until He does. And let us do that in our homes and let us do that in our own lives. So each week, what I'm going to do is give you an EBC action step towards rebuilding our foundation. And so here's today's. I'll put it on the screen, and then when we split, we'll actually do it together. And then if you're at home, I want to encourage you to do it there. Tonight, what we'll do following Nehemiah is pray in faith according to God's will and character. God, because of your steadfast love and because of your power, you can revitalize Emmanuel Baptist Church, and we pray that you will. It would sound something like that. Secondly, though, we would all would need to do this. Confess our sin to God in prayer. Lord, in order for you to do that reviving work, let it start in me. Uh, let me give an example. I had the joy of watching Roland's sermon from last Sunday, which I thought was outstanding. And after the sermon, I found myself saying, Lord, I know there are times that I am not as bold as I ought to be when there is an opportunity right in front of me that I know I could have made a comment that would have steered it towards the gospel, but in self-preserving love, I sort of avoided that. So that's the kind of thing I have to acknowledge as not right in order for God to start turning me in the direction I need to go. Let me encourage you as a Christian to not be afraid to confess your sin to someone who already knows it and already paid for all of it. <laughs> So to him, you're just acknowledging what he knows so that he can help direct you as the verse we began with, a vessel unto honor, useful to the master for every good work. So that begins with saying, Lord, I need to acknowledge before you, I need your help and I haven't done what I should have done. Please help me. And he will. The Lord gives grace to the humble. He only resists the proud. Number three. Ground your prayer, and this is why you can pray with that level of honesty, in God's saving and enabling grace. So as Nehemiah did in verses 10 and 11, thank you, Lord, that you have redeemed us and that you have made us your servants. But you can never pray with full transparency unless you have absolute certainty that you are his and he is yours forevermore. And with that certainty, you're able to pray that way. So I'm going to pray for us publicly, and then we'll turn off the video. Krista will share some specific prayer requests of people in our church. And then we'll want to pray this way for our church, and I want to encourage you to do that at home. Okay, let me pray. Lord, I do pray ser seriously, Lord, that you would send revival and that it would start in me. Uh, Lord, I am a sinner saved by grace, and on my best days, I am still a sinner <laughs> saved only by grace. And so... You know better than I even know myself many ways in which you need to change my heart and my direction so that I can be a more useful vessel. And I pray that for Emmanuel Baptist Church. Lord, I pray that you would bring us to change, repentance, to growth, that you would revive us. Lord, let us not blame the storm as a reason that we find cracks in the foundation because we know that there is a foundation that is so solid that no storm can knock it over. 
And so I pray, Lord, that you would do something that shows your glory and power, that you, even in the most dire of circumstances, will build a healthy, vibrant, uh, gospel-driven church in which new people are saved and missionaries are grown and sent out of this congregation, in which this congregation is constantly raising up new leaders, in which there is generational love and accountability with one another, in which we help each other bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ, in which we see each other as brothers and sisters that we love enough to help in the most holy faith. Uh, I pray that you would do that this year. Thank you for a new year. Thank you for the new birth. Thank you for the new hope that we always have in Christ who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you for the book of Nehemiah, which does give us wonderful principles about rebuilding a foundation. I pray that you would move it towards us. But I pray, finally, that we would simply pray, um, that we'd be a praying people and a praying church. And perhaps if someone's watching this evening who does not know the Lord to whom we pray, may they understand that we do not have access to the Father because of our merit or because of our behavior or our worth. That in fact, our only access to the Father is through Jesus Christ, who is the one mediator between God and man, whose blood has covered our sins, who has redeemed us, and we've received that simply by faith, and that's a work not of ourselves. And I pray that you would draw them to yourself also. Work in the moments that follow for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you much. Uh, So...